Hi, I'm David Rasmussen. Welcome to Colorado Cinema Spotlight. And today we're pleased to be with Patrick Sheridan. It's great to have you here with us today. Looking forward to it. Thanks for having me. Yeah, okay. Um, usually we get right into what got people started in film, what they're doing, but I mean, you've got so many credentials. I want to start out today just hearing some of the things that you're involved in right now, um, what you're doing right now. Right now. Um, I'm working on two screenplays that I've been hired to write by um, one's a Colorado producer, one's an out-of-state producer. They're both through Writers Guild. Um, so I'm working on those. Working on a web series, we're in po the final stages of post-production on our first feature film, Jimmy Said. I'm working on a web series called The Stalker and trying to get the latest batch of films out to the public. Okay. On top of that, I run something called the Emergent Filmmakers Project at the Bug Theater. We show locally produced films the third Thursday of every month. We've been doing that for 10 years. Uh, we've had people who have gone on to win Oscars screen there. Um, I'm involved with the Colorado Actors, Scripts, and Films, uh, CASA people, um, which is a 2,000-member community, online community. Um, and I recently opened up an acting academy for film acting, called the <laughs> Film Acting Academy of Denver. So Great, great so, credentials, great oh, involvement. Thanks. It's wonderful to see that coming yeah. out of a local yeah. uh, filmmaker. Yeah. Okay, then let's step back and okay, let's, let's go way back. back. Way and, back. Um, what first kind of started all this off, I mean, how did you... Were you always interested in film? Did it kind of grow on you? Was there a specific moment? And then was there a first film that you could tell us about that you remember? Yeah, um, I, I come from a family of storytellers. Uh, my mother was a fantastic storyteller, mm -hmm. and my father was a very funny man. <laughs> um, so I was always interested in that. I started writing uh, screenplays in my early 20s. And my first screenplay got stolen by a Taiwanese director and turned it into <laughs> a martial arts movie overseas that wow. uh, I recently had a friend called I think I just saw your movie in this Japanese bar um, and then um, kept developed my craft as a screenwriter mm -hmm. eventually went to the Vancouver Film School wow. uh, that was about 12 years ago um, I've optioned a handful of scripts over the years and really after film school I had a lot of meetings in Hollywood with people that wanted me to write their stuff and mm -hmm. I really wanted to have my movies made so I kind of change focus and wow. tried to figure out how to make movies and so um, about 2003 or so that was the game plan and then uh, birth of my first son Elliot put things on hold and then he was about a year and a half and I looked at him one day and was like how do I get you to pursue your dreams if mm -hmm. I'm not doing mine? yourself great so I pretty much that day quit a very high paying job in mm -hmm. corporate America to pursue filmmaking wow. and so my first short came out in 2005 I had no idea what I was doing I would you consider that your first film or? that would be my first film that I made that I mm -hmm. that I feel ownership of mm -hmm. and really for me the the key to it was I gave myself permission to fail um, because I'm kind of a perfectionist and nobody wants and I said if this movie is terrible I don't have to show it to anybody which I think is a mistake a lot of indie filmmakers make. It's like, if it's bad, you don't have to show it. <laughs> in fact, we would prefer that you not. <laughs> um, but in part because I had a really good crew, the movie turned out pretty well. Wow. And then um, every month for about a year, I made another short just teaching myself the craft. And most of them I just put away and moved on to the next thing with the idea that I'd eventually make a feature. Uh -huh. And I started shooting my first feature in 2009 called Jimmy Said. So how much filmmaking have you done before the feature? Um, I probably had done 12 shorts of my okay. own and okay. worked on probably 20 others and continued to write and try and sell screenplays out to Hollywood. And So I was constantly working on, on my craft and anytime I got a chance to be on set I did that. So Okay, um, okay. And then started shooting Jimmy Said in 2009. Mm -hmm. We shot more of it late 2010 and it's almost done here in post-production okay, so okay. Um, and then after Jimmy said uh, I realized the things that I didn't know uh, I was very prepared but prepared in very much the wrong way for Jimmy said mm -hmm. it's like you you think you know what you need to know but until you do it you don't know what you need well, to you know learn it on, yeah learn it on a project yes. like that and so uh, the last uh, really 2011 and 2012 mm -hmm. have been to sort of reteach myself visual storytelling while I continue to work on the writing. And so 
Jimmy said, is finally going to see the light of day, I hope, by, before the end of this year, and um, getting ready to shoot the next feature. Okay. So. Okay. Well, yeah, yeah, I, I still don't quite have the idea of what kind of hooked you into filmmaking. You said your family was, was storytellers. But yeah. then, obviously, you're much more visual and a very different type of right. storytelling. Was it, a, was it watching films that got you involved? Yeah, or was I, it something about I, I television? I think so. Uh, not really television as much as film. Um, I had written a lot of fiction when I was younger and, and kind of thought that uh, I wanted to be a novelist. And I made the mistake of moving into film. It's uh, in hindsight, 20 years later, perhaps I should have stayed Much in less fiction. Less control. Less control. A lot fewer other people that need to say yes. Um, but as I was writing a lot of fiction, more and more of my stories felt like they needed a visual medium. Yeah. Um, and so it's it's funny. We, we'll, I know we'll talk about the barking horse later, yeah. but. The Barking Horse was one of the last things I wrote kind of as I transitioned out of poetry and fiction into film. And it's just been collecting dust all this time. Yeah. Anyway. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. So. But now that you, that you put it that way, storytelling even actually is very visual. You know, people think storytelling is the story, but really it's the visual of the right. person doing it. And you're t transforming that into a camera's eye. Right. So that you really are seeing a visual presentation of, of words, not the words themselves, right. not just the plot. Absolutely. Absolutely. Was there an early movie? What were your favorite early movies, or what was a filmmaker that really kind of, that you really identified with right um, off the bat? I think um, Todd Haynes, who did Superstar, um, the Karen Carpenter story. Mm -hmm. um, there was something about that that was just so freaking courageous. Mm -hmm. Right? He didn't ask anybody's permission to make that movie. In fact, he got sued <laughs> over it, right? Uh, and. Um, I've really admired his work, um, but I just love being entertained at the movie theaters. Mm -hmm. you know I, mean? I think yeah. it's kind of the, the current American storytelling media. Yeah. Uh, so I just really enjoy that process. And you know, when we were little kids, uh, we'd all climb in and hide in the station wagon, go to the drive-in movies, and you know, we went and saw Rosemary's Baby when I was <laughs> six, which maybe wasn't appropriate, but we did. Um, so it was really, I think that you know, yeah. just uh, if you te if you're a storyteller, you want people to hear your story. Yeah. And I think film has that the greatest potential to reach people. Yeah. It's interesting so. you mentioned Polanski because I can yeah. see a little bit of his yeah. his kind of work in your own work. Oh, you know, well, visual you. and the and the way things are framed and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. That's gonna and it's about the human. You know, he always has these really kind of odd stories, but it's always about the human being. Yeah. So Ultimately, kind of it's always about the person and their emotional dilemma, yeah. right? And um, visually what I've been trying to, to capture, especially mm -hmm. after Jimmy said, is visually how can I show this in a way that engages people on what might otherwise be a character study or sort of a straightforward yeah. narrative with a twist or something, but part of the hook needs to be the visuals. and. Um, so that's really what I've been experimenting a lot yeah. with is, is visually how do we tell a story and then how do we take the narrative and mm -hmm. take the narrative and put it upside down so that we're sort of both visually and intellectually engaged in the thing. And some of them have been massive failures, but it's it's been trying to define my own style and approach. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah. It is really hard to describe that, and so I think what we need to do is look at look at one of your films. Sure. Because that'll just nail it right, right. there. When you, everything you're talking about right now, the, the film shows you actually doing exactly right. what you say you're striving to do, what you right. want to do here. And this is going to be served. And this is going to be served. Right. Should we look and at which, served first. Y yeah. Let's yeah. show served first, which yeah. is probably the most traditional of the narratives and the most traditional mm -hmm. of the visual approach. Uh, but the idea of sort of a twist that oh we expect this. We're pretty sure we expect this, but at the end it's that. And then what, what happens, I think, a lot of times is people go back and think, well, was that twist justified? Did they earn it? And I like when people go back and go, the clues were there all along. How did I miss that? You know, so, it's great um, storytelling. It's great mystery writing. Yeah, Don't so, uh, but yeah. Serve was a, a blast to make. and. Uh, um, now this is a fairly fun. recent film, yes. though. It's not the first thing you wrote, you made, or before Jimmy said, or anything. This is fairly no. Recent. It was the first thing after Jimmy said, um, when I realized I needed to teach myself the visual components of it. I was also at the time launching a film acting academy. Mm -hmm. I had so many local actors come up and say, "Help!" I had a lot of theater actors come up and say, "How do I make this transition?" 
And I was doing private lessons, and finally, so many came. So you need to open up a, a shop. And so with that and the buying my own equipment, started putting these things together. Wrote a script for Serve that was a class exercise. Wow. And wow. The people in class liked it so much. They said we need to make this and. Uh, had some actors interested, and the bar we shot in is right across the Bug Theater where I do a lot of work, and I said, you can come in on a Sunday and shoot it, but it has to be this Sunday. And right. So we were there. So that's uh, cool. that's how Serve came about. It was really, uh, like so many things, an accidental movie. But Weren't you saying something about the actress, too? Oh, the actress, that. Laurel Harris. Yeah, she, um, right before we shot Serve, she was cast in a, an Odd Thomas movie. She's playing the wife of William Defoe's character. And she was going sag, and she called me up and said, Patrick, if we're going to do a movie, we have to do one like now because I'm going to be sag, and I won't be able to work Can't on your it. stuff. And I'm going to L.A. I'm going to move to L.A., so let's make a movie. So I sent her a bunch of scripts. She picked this one. And um, I said, well, who would you like to work with? She said, Bill Lavasser. I said, well, I've known Bill forever, so let's mm. call Bill and have him come down. And uh, so Bill and Laurel... They we're did, on set, and we just filled job. it with everybody we could find to fill up that bar and, and um, had a crew of about three, which is what I like. Okay. So it was a lot of fun. Okay, then let's take a look at it, because then everybody will know exactly what we're yes. talking about, and we'll have even more to talk about. We'll have more to talk about, okay. absolutely. So we'll come back and talk about this film, all right? Awesome. Okay, we're going to take a look at this first film by our guest, Patrick Sheridan. It's called Served. first day. It was your first day? Wait. <laughs> Do you serve anyone we know? Not yet. I had Bill Anderson. Bill Anderson from basketball? Different Bill Anderson. And whatever happened to that guy anyway? He's a cop. Wait, bong hit Bill Anderson's a cop. Yeah, ironic, isn't it? <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> I think you mean sardonic. No, I'm pretty sure she means ironic. You doing okay? It's kind of weird and a little awesome. Please tell me you know her. Joanne? Yeah. I've never seen her before today. Joanne Nolan? Yes, I'm Joanne. I'm so sorry to have to do this. Do you want a hug? You know, I wish it was bong hit Bill Anderson from basketball. That guy's a real prick. This Bill Anderson was a regular person, like us. Bill? Bill Anderson? I'm sorry, do I know you? Wow, you're a big fella, aren't you? I'm sorry. This is for you. to it. Yeah. Look, I say screw Bill Anderson, all right? I mean, you don't get served unless you've screwed up or something, right? Yeah. About that. 
Drinks are on me, honey. That was served by our filmmaker, Patrick Sheridan. Good film. Thanks a lot for letting us thanks, show that. Thanks for showing yeah. that. I just realized that it hasn't screened anywhere before. So, so we're the first. So okay. you guys are the world premiere of a paddy wagon film, for better or worse. Great, great. Well, that's, You'll, that's, you lose that's all good your news. funding. Uh, no, I don't think so. Okay, so tell us a little bit about this film. First of all, what was the inspiration for it, the story? Um, how did it come about? It came about because I have a friend who... Um, was a pretty bad process server. He just kind of didn't have the what it takes to do that. And then I started thinking, what would be the worst kind of process server ever? And that would be a woman who's very empathetic to other people's needs and just, you know, wore her heart on her sleeve. And that would eventually probably drive you insane. And so I like this idea of situations where, you know, a person is the worst thing that could happen is also the best thing, or the best thing could be the worst, you know? And, mm -hmm. and so it really came about thinking about that. And then uh, through the Acting Academy, I'm writing scripts all the time. And this was one that was originally written as a class project. And some of the actors liked it so much, they're like, you should really make a movie for it. Um, and then I talked with Laurel Harris, and she was just one of the ones I sent her, and she just really really liked it and I thought she'd be perfect for it so so then you're off and running yeah it was really kind of an accidental again most so many of my films are accident all the ones that I've been planning to make <laughs> they never get made it's the ones that sort of come up in the meantime so it was really that it was about you know what okay what so be like once, the, once you had the script and you had the actress and you knew you were going to do this then how do you begin to put the film pull the film together or plan it or organize it or don't you um one of the things that I'm working on is becoming more organized, because I see the film in my head, but I need to mm -hmm. translate that to the rest of the crew. But this one came about so quickly because Laurel had to leave. Um, mm -hmm. We just met at Patsy's Italian Inn, and I knew what I wanted, and I shot it because I was trying to teach myself more about that. Okay. And we had three hours in the bar to shoot, so... Um, it would have been nice to storyboard it, but we just didn't have, didn't time. have time. And so we just kind of really threw it together. And like I mentioned to you earlier, one of the recurring themes of my movies is after they're done, people are always surprised they turned out <laughs> they so <were>. well. <laughs> it's like, how did that fiasco turn into that? And so um, a camera angle, do you have that in your mind beforehand? Or when you're setting up, do you think, oh, I better do this one close, I better do this one far away? Uh, is it random? Do you do uh, several? No, it's not, it's not real random. I have a, that I already have in my head. Okay. And uh, one of the things I've been teaching myself is better storyboarding, better shot list so that the rest of the crew knows what we're working on. Mm -hmm. uh, but I have a very uh, kind of clear idea of what I want what I want to capture when we go into that. And um, what I really wanted to capture on that was um, sort of the intimacy between the two and, and kind of that the male character, he was asking all the right questions, but he wasn't really totally engaged, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And so we wanted to we wanted to see him kind of get his just desserts at the end and that kind of character study and, and um, how her day has gone from bad to worse. Okay. So. Now you said you said one of your objects in doing these shorts or doing this one to begin with and then others was to translate to a more visual uh, type of storytelling rather than just the, the verse. So how did you do this with this project? With this project, um, the other thing that I've been working on is kind of not only the visual change, but a visual twist, but also having a narrative twist. And, and this one I really focused on the narrative twist. Okay. Uh, visually, what I tried to do really is, is keep reminding the audience that they were in a bar. Because the, the title served, we, I didn't want people to think this was a process server. Um, and um, so kind of really kept moving in on Laurel and how much pain she was in doing this job that she obviously needed. 
Um, and, um, but at the same time, really trying to find unique ways um, to show things. Like um, one of my favorite shots in the movie is when she knocks on the door and then you see her through the screen door. You know, mm -hmm. we were looking for those type of opportunities um, uh, on a very, you know, without having to move the camera a lot, but those type of shots. And then to kind of keep putting her in unusual, unusual, to keep putting her in unusual situations where she would be serving somebody. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, so. something that just occurs to me is the, the opening opening shot, I think, where she's looking on her cell phone, you know, and right. instead of having another character tell her, you need to visit this person and hand them this, or right. this is your next client or whatever, you just have her looking at it, which really piques the audience's interest. Right. It's purely visual. It doesn't right. even come into play until really, again, until the very end of the movie. Right, yeah. End of the movie. And um, we had a buddy who had a jib, said, hey, you want to try this? And we're like, yeah, we have yeah. this cool location in front of the bar. and. Yeah. So we did that with the idea of like, well, what's, what importance does this guy have to her? And then you, she goes in the bar and you say, oh, she's meeting her boyfriend. But then you realize, no, that, that's her next person she has to serve. Okay. So, did you, was the script pretty much what, what it was to begin with? Or did you, did you adjust it a little bit when uh, you came to From the first shooting? time that I wrote it and, and presented it to class, one of the... Um, dirty little secrets about my film classes, my acting class, as I use it to workshop my scripts. <laughs> well, that's not dirty, that's, that's productive. You know, and so it went through, you know, probably a dozen okay. revisions to make it, you know, as tight as we could. Yeah, I'm yeah. guessing you pared down, pared down, pared, pared down, down. Pared down, and, and try and get as rid of as much repetitive dialogue. You know, if it, you never want the audience to go, okay, we get it, move on. Right. And so right. we try and... I think that's one of the reasons my movies tend to be fairly short yeah. is that I trust that the audience gets what's going on yeah. Yeah. and I don't want to keep spoon feeding them. Yeah. It's like, okay, she's had a bad day. He's kind of a jerk. What's her first day? Who's this woman she just yeah. hugged? Let's get move, on with it. You know, get on kind with of it. People like, doing this to oh, the screen. she's serving what? I just did, and then yeah. like, oh. Okay. Oh, that's so. cool. Well, see, my complaint would be that your films are too short. So it's going to be interesting to see how you jump to a feature film from right. these wonderful gems. Right. But we can talk more about that later. Well, that's one of the uh, nicest things you could say to a filmmaker yeah. is that your films are too short. short. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so let's, well, let's look at the next film because, again, it's another one of these vis visual gems that you put together. Um, it's Knock Knock, right? Knock Knock. Okay. Right. What can you tell us about this? First of all, has it had any screenings, awards? It has. It has screened. Uh, the Knock Knock was part of the Hint Fiction Film Contest, and the, the male actor in served as Bill Lavaster, a <clears throat> fantastic commercial actor up in Denver, and I've known him for a really long time. Mm. Um, and the one story I'll share is that uh, Bill and I took an acting class together, I don't know, about a dozen years ago, and after one class I said to Bill, I said, you know, neither one of us have any talent. And he's like, that's not going to stop me. <laughs> But it always didn't stop you either. No, and he's one of the you know the most successful commercial actors in, in Denver now. Um, but uh, he was listening to NPR one morning and heard this thing about the Hint Fiction anthology. And Hint Fiction is pieces of fiction that are 25 words or less. Okay. Probably the most famous is the Ernest Hemingway one called uh, For Sale Baby Shoes Never Worn. That's mm. it. That's the whole piece. Mm. So he contacted the publisher and got the right to the anthology because he wanted to make a film contest. And so those who entered got three stories out of the ten they picked, oh, and you had to do your visual interpretation of the piece of fiction. Awesome. And great for the anthology and great for the filmmaking. Yes, it was, it was a lot of fun. Um, and there's no time limit other than the movie had to be a minute, but there's no time limit as far as when you could produce it. It wasn't like a fast cool. film where you had 24 hours or 48 hours. And uh, the top 10 played at the Vail Film Festival. Hmm. And we made the top 10. And my sources through the grapevine said we came in second. So a, a really nice film from Denver filmmaker Nelson Goforth won. Okay. Um, okay. But ours was a knock-knock joke. Um, and um, it turns out it was by a Denver novelist named Nick Arvin. Oh, cool. Um, and he really liked it. So that was... He liked the but, film. He liked the film a yeah. lot. So that yeah. was very really important to me. And Did you consult with him much before the film? No, or did you just see no, the finished product? I, I, he just saw the finished product. And the woman who was um, in a film we're going to see later, The Barking Horse, she was in a film, uh, a project I did called Hands of the Carpenter. It was for a nonprofit. Okay. It was uh, this organization that helps single women with car repairs. 
they just help them make Great. car repairs, yeah, right? Some people are going to want that website. Yeah, <laughs> right. And uh, and you start talking to the. We had to interview a lot of the women for it, and their stories are just heartbreaking. Mm. And getting a five hundred dollar car repair was like winning the lottery for them. And some of their backgrounds were just horrific. Yeah. And I had been talking to Bill about this hint fiction. He event, he originally wanted me to help him promote it through the Emerging Filmmakers Project and some other stuff. Um, and then, uh, so after the hands of the carpenter thing, I really wanted to do a movie that had a positive relationship between a young woman and her dad. And I've got the knock-knock joke. And so we were shooting Hands of the Carpenter and knock-knock the same day. Because um, that's when people Another were available. Another train wreck that somehow turned out pretty. Yeah. <laughs> and so that's what the whole knock-knock thing was. And, okay. Um, so it was really about a woman who is in a life-altering event, and as she is possibly dying, mm -hmm. her, the memory that helps her get through this is a very positive memory that she had as a young girl uh, with her father. Wow. And so Christine's daughter, Kylie, played oh, the woman really? as a kid. Oh, wonderful. And uh, so we tried to create, a, 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 again, a twist on that. So that's what Knock Knock was all about. Okay. We're going to look at the one film, minute. I have one question. I have one question. Sure. Did you ever talk to the writer of the story and say what the inspiration for this, this story was? I haven't. We keep trying to meet for drinks. I've become yeah. uh, Facebook buddies with okay. him. He's a Denver uh, novelist, and he travels a lot with okay. his work. But uh, okay. Nick Arvin is his name, and he just came out with a new novel. Um, and so I hope that I get to... Uh, chat with Nick about it. Okay. So. It'd be interesting to see if it comes from some totally different the sort of reasoning did, or yeah. similar or what. But he, he did mention that it was so different than what he imagined oh, uh, okay. and uh, his feedback was very positive. He was very happy with it. He promoted the, the video. Okay. So in the end, uh, having his blessing on it was much more important to me than than winning the uh, contest, okay. though to be honest, I would have liked to have won the too. contest. Yeah, I would have had a nice second, little hardware. Second place. Yeah, maybe okay. it was eighth. Maybe that was just them being nice to me. But it was funny when we watched it. Um, uh, Christine and her daughter Kylie got to be there, um, and um, her daughter, who was eight, was running around Vail telling everybody that she's a major movie star, <laughs> and her heart was broken when we didn't win. So. Well, she's so, got a, a long future ahead of her, at least. In theory, yes. So. Anyway. Okay, let's take a look at so it. Knock, knock, yeah. This is great. Okay, let's take a look at this film by our guest, Patrick Sheridan. Knock, knock. Do you know where you are? No. Tell me what you see. I see my father by the sink with white sleeves rolled. Knock, knock. Who's there? She loves. She loves who? Exactly. Knock, knock. Who's there? Daddy loves. Daddy loves who? Colorado Cinema Spotlight, that was Knock Knock by our guest, Patrick Sheridan. What can I say? What can I say? It's really extraordinary. It's yeah. really, it's a very, very short piece. It's amazing how fast it goes. It had to be a minute. We were at 59 seconds, so. Uh, yeah. oh, but it just packs a wall up. The story yeah. did to begin with, I'm sure, but what you've done with the cinema is well, amazing. Thanks. Yeah, it was, it was a fun piece, and um, um, after the film, everybody just wanted to talk about the car crash. The very beginning of it. The very beginning of, of, of the film. And, so you're uh, gonna tell us how you do it. They were like, "How do you do that? How do you do that?" And, and it's like, <laughs> "It's really easy. You 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 park the two cars next to each other, right? And then you have them go in reverse. You flip the video, accelerate at the end. That's it. Uh, That's and then cheating. shoot from the inside. Now the secret though is that the car that could hit the other car, you make sure that's in reverse before you hit the <laughs> other car. You don't want people to." 
and then uh, put or you in just the went over budget. Yeah, yeah, you put sounds. in the screeching tire sound and broken glass mm -hmm. and get it over with quick, and people will think, "Oh my, that was a car crash." Wow, yeah, great. So that was uh, great. Now, did you think up that, or did you get that from somebody else? Um, I kind of thought about it, and then I thought I better do some research. So I did some searching on Google and stuff, and okay. and got basically that yes, I'm on the right track. Though nobody threw out the warning about the reverse because yeah. we almost had an accident. So. Yeah. But uh, it's one of the things that was interesting. We shot that out in front of the Bug Theater at 2 in the morning. Mm -hmm. And um, every film that I have shot since 2011, the authorities have showed up in some capacity. And they funny. asked us to stop filming. So, You filmmakers, get your permits. Ah, <laughs> uh, really? Yeah. Yeah. And that's pretty standard protocol for them, huh? Well, we had lots of lights out on the streets and yeah, yeah. Wow. vacant car accidents. And <laughs> yeah, that is, it could be, yeah, it could be dangerous. If but if you didn't need know what footage doing. of police arriving, yeah, I'm saying just, you should you know, just turn on the cameras. Turn you on the cameras, it. yeah. Just set up your lights, turn on your cameras, and you got lots of footage. Yeah. You could Fake gun sell. will make them come even quicker. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we're not going any farther. That's your free that tip, young filmmakers. <laughs> Well, we got we've got more good film to look at here. Okay. So so while we could spend more time with Knock Knock, I think we want to we want to go ahead and head out to the next one here. Um, barking. The Barking Horse. The Barking Horse. Yeah. Um, a great film. Okay. Uh, let's get a little background on this before we go into it. Okay. Because um, this is this is unusual. Not 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 like what we've already seen already. Right. Yeah. This. Um, it was uh, like I've said, sort of an accidental film. Yeah. Um, First of all, the, the, the poem that it was based on was written in 1988. Yeah. It was a time in my life when I was kind of at a crossroads. I have a, we have alcoholism in our family, mm. and I was really kind of moving down that path. Huh. And I realized that most of the misery in my life was all self-inflicted, mm -hmm. right? That the people who were leaving me were leaving me for really good reasons, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? And this poem kind of came out of that, that... Uh, um, when you call people you love things that aren't appropriate, they tend to go away. Uh, and so that's kind of where the, the poem started. Mm -hmm. And the very first line in it was, uh, if I had a white horse, I'd name him Brown Cow, just so I could say, how now, horse brown cow. That was the first line, and everything was really built out, out of that. But it was, it was really a very personal poem. Mm -hmm. it was, I don't think it reflects well on me as a person. Hmm. Um, hmm. That's but I think if you're going to do art, you have to be honest. You have to be true. And so I've never shied away from sort of exposing my sins. Yeah. Um, but, and it was a poem that after I wrote it, I always wanted to do something with it. I thought that it would make a great visual presentation, but it just kind of got lost. For a few years. years. For more than a few years. Yes, for a few years. Uh, and... Um, in um, a friend of mine, John Hartman, does something called The Indie Underground. It's all avant-garde um, art film. A lot of it is just shot on Super 8 or 16 millimeter. Mm -hmm. um, is this out of Colorado? That's or up this? in Denver. And it's just crazy stuff. Huh. Uh, and all of them are real visual artists. And he'd been asking me for a year and a half to submit something. And I finally said, John, if I make a poetry film, will you please leave me alone? Yeah. And he said, yes, just make something. Yeah. And I actually had a different film in mind. I had a different poem that I wanted to do. Mm. Uh, it was about being a young boy and watching my father do paratrooper training. Mm. But that required family oh, footage you know, yeah. that my brothers have. And like I said, they're alcoholics, so I didn't count on getting that footage. Mm. And as his event was approaching, I had about a month before the event, and we had shot Hands of the Carpenter and Knock Knock on that same day. And during a break, I was telling the actress, I said, well, I have this thing due. She goes, what are you going to do? I said, well, I have this poem that I kind of have an idea for. She goes, well, send me the poem. I said, well, I don't know. I want to shoot it in a different way. I want to stop thinking of film in the way that cinematographers do and think of it more in terms of the way a photographer would. Wow. I have a niece in Indiana that's just this amazing photographer. Wow. Um, and I kept thinking, well, how would Bobby, Michelle shoot these things, right? Like still why, lives. Like still lives. Like, yeah, why, do we, why does a photographer look at something and frame it this way? And as soon as we turn the camera on, we 
change it. Pans and and yeah. so we really thought, I want this to be almost like a series of photographs with the people moving within it. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wanted a photographer really to shoot it with me. Um, and Christine said, well, I'm a photographer. Oh. And she sent me her stuff. I went, well, that would be awesome. And, uh, and I said to her, I said, I think you're too young for this movie because you were like six when, we made the, when I made the poem. Uh, and she said, well, I would love to do it. And we started talking. We realized that she and I could be in it, and we were also the entire crew. So it was just the two of us were cast and crew mm -hmm. running around for four days to shoot it all. And um, it, uh, we edited it the night before the Indie <laughs> Underground. I didn't really even look at it till it was complete. Yeah. And after I watched it, I was like, whoa, this is really good. And then the Indie Underground got canceled due to a big snowstorm. Oh, please. <laughs> so oh, after you've done I, all that I work. I had this work, and, um, and fortunately it played at Festivus at the beginning of the year, oh. and um, we can talk more about that yeah. after it. Yeah, it, we will. We so. will. Anyway, it was another accidental film that somehow turned out really nice. Okay. So. Okay. Great. Let's ta let's take All a right. look at it. All right. Another film from our filmmaker Patrick Sheridan. This is Barking Horse. I had a dog. His name was Horse. He'd come when I call. Sometimes fetch. Roll over, play dead. Sometimes shake your hand. Sometimes. He'd have been a dog-eared dog, I know, had he a dog-eared dog name. One day he ran away, and while away, I'd hear the song of my missing dog. So out I went, calling his name, my lost friend, the barking horse. So this woman, this woman I love, said, such foolish things you say and do, it's not foolish for the ones you love, said I. But that day, or so it seems, he went away, away for good. So I got a cat, I named her Mouse. She ate the fish I called Bird. The neighbors too were confused. I called them friends, they used a different word. One day I said to this woman, this woman I love, if I had a white horse, I'd call him Brown Cow, just so I could say, how now, horse Brown Cow? So this woman, this woman I love, said, if you don't know the names of things, how can you mean most anything? In my fit, I said some things, and then some things I should not have said, and did not say the things I should have said. And so she went away, or so it seems, like my dog, the barking horse. Of all the things left to say, I have only one wish I wish to say. I'm sorry in the way words do not convey. And I'd say all those things that I've saved up, if only this woman, this woman I love, would find her way back to me and help me find my barking horse. So I could call this house a home. This is Colorado Cinema Spotlight. That was The Barking Horse by our guest, Patrick Sheridan. Welcome. Boy, that's good. That's, that's good, good stuff. Yeah. So, um, okay, let's talk about this film now. All right. Um, what kind of screenings, awards has it won? Or uh, It played at Festivus at the beginning of the year. Uh, it's played a few other festivals. It was scheduled to play some others, but we've decided to change our sort of distribution strategy. Um, it was funny, I got a lot of calls from screeners at festivals who called after seeing and saying, I normally don't do this, but your movie touched me. Mm. And then three or four weeks later, I get a call from the festival director saying, we don't know what to do with your movie, so we have no place for it in the festival. And 
the feedback that we've gotten from the film is that people want to see it. They want to share it with people. Um, the just through the limited viewings that there's been, I get a call once a week from somebody that saw it. Mm -hmm. Last week I got a call from somebody in Maryland who saw it, and she said, because of this movie, I found a way to forgive my ex-husband. Awesome. Like, Whoa. That's amazing. Yeah. And so we just really started thinking of ways that we can get this movie out mm -hmm. that people can see it. Um, and I have a friend that is a social media director for Boston Market, of all things. And he was the keynote speaker in mm -hmm. August for, I want to make sure I have this right, it's mm -hmm. Social Media Strategy Summit, I believe is, okay. is the term. And he asked if he could include it as part of his presentation on digital Kaizen, which is improvement through one step at a time. Wow. And he showed it during that and asked the participants there to support the movie, tweet it, uh, send people links, put it on their Twi their fault, you know, their just do Twitter the social feed. media, yeah, right. Do the the social media thing, yeah. and um, it was just kind of an experiment to see if this would reach people. And by four o'clock that day, it had been apparently been sent out to over thirty five thousand people. <laughs> now I haven't, you know. So this is great. How would you get that response from any other kind of online posting? I, I don't hosting? know. So it's um, you know we're taping this shortly after that, uh, yeah. so. Maybe we can update people on how that's huge going. Huge so, success. Um, that's great. But it's it's been amazing the, the response. One of the really yeah. funny tweets was, um, um, you know, incredible message. Men are just bad communicators. <laughs> you know, <laughs> if one that's of, not going to get people. Yeah, interest. one of them was confusing and amazing, but yeah. it was mostly, uh, you know, whenever I screen it, people come up and just share what it meant to them, and yeah. so. That's what we want people to do. We want well, but to it's so to... much easier this way, too. Think of the yeah. festivals where you just have a few people, a handful or dozens even, right. out of 35,000. Right, yeah. That's and amazing. you figure, you know, your submission fee, going to the festival, yeah. those expenses just really rack up. Yeah. And um, I, I raised a six- and an eight-year-old, and I don't have a lot of time for festivals, and I certainly don't have the money for it. Yeah. And yeah. This just made sense for a movie that wow. just touches people, so we, we wanted to get it out. Well, and congratulations. So it, was, it was way... It's a way cool experience. Yeah, yeah, so, that's wonderful. Yeah. Okay, now let's talk about the film because okay. it's just great. Now you were saying earlier that you wrote the poem way back at a bad time. Yeah. You know, I didn't get that impression at first. I just thought this was a guy who was really good with words and right. was kind of eccentric and really. And toward the end, then of course you realize that he's driving these creatures and these people out of his life. Right. It takes that kind of subtle twist, not the sharp twist that you were talking right. about in earlier films. Right. But it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful story. But again, your main thrust in making this was for it to be visual. You use a poem to do visual filmmaking. Right. Yeah. It's so uh, unusual in that the guy won't shut up. <laughs> you know, well, he's just talking yeah. the whole way through. But it's really the visual mm -hmm. uh, that kind of makes you stay engaged. Yeah. Uh, and then so many people afterwards say, I want to have a copy of the poem. Um, so how did you come by the visual? How did you the visual begin to like put we mentioned earlier? We just visual. really wanted it to look like a photographer was in charge of it. We really that was your your idea. Yes, or? from the get-go, is I just wanted as non-traditional a visual presentation okay. as possible. Okay. Um, and it's interesting because in some ways it's as conventional as possible. The camera doesn't move once, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. um, but we really wanted to create the story dynamics through these other images that showed their relationship, that showed the dog, yeah. that showed. Um, these objects that they had accumulated over the years on the steps. Now, who picked out the objects? How did those, you come by the objects? Um, it's, it's really funny. Um, half of them are mine. Half of them were the actress, uh, talented uh -huh. actress, Christine McQuillan, who's in Denver, and she helped shoot it. She was a photographer. All of the objects she brought were really important to her. You know, they were like from her grandmother and they had great <laughs> sentimental value. I pretty much ran to Goodwill the day of the shoot, you know, so it was like, That's except for maybe great. the little camera, it was, you know, all yeah. just stuff I could gather together and all the stuff that she brought was very meaningful mm -hmm. to her mm -hmm. uh, but we just wanted it to look like things that people would accumulate right. in a lifetime right. and then the other thing that we wanted to kind of show was how their relationship evolved based on where they were in proximity to each other where they were on the steps yeah. moving left to right up and down and so almost every time you see them their relationship physically is different where they are on the frame is is changing so mm -hmm. 
those are the kind of things that we really emphasize. And then a lot of the images um, we storyboarded, not the whole poem, but a lot of the images that. Uh, um, I mean, like the like the, the horses, the animals. Must the have been the hard horse, to work yeah, with. that was uh, that was crazy because um, you know one of the secrets is you know I like to tell people that we cast Christine because she was a photographer and she's a wonderful actor. But really, the way, reason she got cast was she has a dog, she has a horse, <laughs> you know, and so I needed both. Really, your casting. That's you right. That that was the main reason, and the um, the place where she um, keeps her horse, there's a white horse. Um, and we tried to get that white horse to come out so we could shoot it, and it just refused. It just mm -hmm. refused. Mm -hmm. And so all day what we would do is we would frame something. We would shoot us in the frame. We'd run back, look at it, see if we liked it, then we'd turn the camera on and go back. Right. Um, and it wasn't until I got home to start editing that we realized that one take and one take only the white horse came out, did its dramatic dramatic pause in the sunlight, and then walked away. And that was the only time that we You didn't we got think you had a shot? Never thought we had a shot of the white horse. And then okay. the, uh, when we got everything, we said, oh, let's run and get the white horse that we actually got right up to it and shot mm -hmm. some. But we, we didn't realize we had that shot until mm -hmm. we went to edit it. Mm -hmm. So, that's, yeah. Um, But yeah, so all the objects were supposed to have some meaning and, and really their relationship to one another. Yeah. And you would both look through the camera together. I mean, she yes. would frame it for like a still shot and you would frame it for like a film. Yeah, well, no, every shot was for, uh, uh, we, we tried to do every frame as if the idea was, what is the most interesting way we can shoot this particular thing? What is the most photographic? What is the most interesting? What is the prettiest? What is the, what image is capturing this mood the best? Um, and at no time, were any of the decisions based on this is what would be best for the movie. It was always, what does this one moment need? Okay. And, um, and it was kind of funny because it was just the two of us, and we looked like probably the biggest amateurs ever <laughs> because we, you know, we'd turn the camera on, and then we'd run, and then we'd run back, and, and um, none of the sound, because we were trying to say the poem while yeah. we were in location, none of that came across. And I couldn't remember the poem for the life of me. So before every take, she's on her cell phone where she downloaded it, trying yes. to get me to remember the lines. Right. Okay. Um, so it was, it was a total comedy of errors. And it wasn't until we put it all together that it was like, whoa, we have something here. Yeah. Even the music, um, that was just the second piece of music I listened to on Creative Commons. And the first couple bars sounded right. I put it in. It fit. And I, I haven't done anything to the music. And it feels, people say, well, who composed it? And, <sighs> It just fit perfect, so huh. Huh. so it was it was a very interesting project yeah. and and um, overwhelmed by the response. Okay. Certainly not the intention. I mean, the intention was to make this film for the Indie Underground, finally do something with this piece that I've had forever, yeah. and it's turned out to be a piece of mine so far that has touched people the most. Yeah. And you're pleased with it, too. I mean, you're talking about how this uh, is important to you for a oh, long time. Oh, very, very excited. It turned out the way, way you wanted, better than you wanted? Uh, much better than I expected. Uh, and when we were shooting, it was like, we have some really good stuff here. But um, it still kind of amazes me that I made that. Yeah. <laughs> you know? that's the, you know? I think that's a sign of true creativity. Yeah. When you surpass yourself, yeah. you know there's got to be a creative element there to, to yeah. bring out something that you didn't even know you could do. Yeah. Yeah, and, and when you bring other talented people and you have yeah. to allow for the possibility that they can make it better. Oh, absolutely. You know, I think That's the fear point. is that they're going to make it worse, and that fear often makes us make compromises. Gotcha. And yeah. when, you, when you make those compromises, sure, you're, you're limiting how bad it could be, but I think you're also limiting how good it can be. And on this particular piece, it was, let's go for broke. And like I said, if it was terrible, nobody had to see it. Yeah. But it, ter yeah. it turned out... Yeah. Remarkable. That is. So, that's just great. That's yeah. just great. Very proud of it. Okay. Okay. Well, we could talk a lot more about this film. Is there anything in particular that you just want to say for sure before we um, before we move on a little bit? Really, um, it's a very personal movie to me. Mm -hmm. um, but I have found once we put it out there, it's everybody is taking something from it, and we're one of the reasons we released it the way we did so that people can see it, and we want them to share with us on Twitter what it meant to them. You know, we want them to share. We want them to, not because we want to rack up a lot of hits on Vimeo. Right, right. I, not I with could, this piece. I could really care less about that. It's yeah. really that people want to see it and share it. And yeah. so that's what, that's, that's what we're interested in doing. 
Okay, well, okay. let's go back to the beginning then now. Let's back talk about some of the stuff you're working on right now. Okay. Um, um, we've got several groups you're organized with and film projects. Um, let's talk about the women's film project first. Sure, the um, Colorado Independent Women of Film, uh, we just completed our second year of that. That's a film festival that's held up at the Bug Theater that is all locally produced movies by women filmmakers. Either they wrote them, they directed them, they edited them. And that came about because at the Emergent Filmmakers Project, also at the Bug Another Theater, project, yeah. um, we find we get a disproportionate number of submissions from men. Mm. And we discovered that men will, you know, they'll take a video of them falling off a trampoline and think it's ready for Sundance. <laughs> and it seems, I don't mean to grossly generalize, but that's exactly what I'm about to do, is that women filmmaker, unless every frame is perfect, everybody's hair, yeah. they don't want anybody to see it. Okay, And sure. so we wanted to create an environment where women would feel safe showing their films. And so sure. local filmmaker Eileen Augusta, um, who if you haven't had on this show, you should have her on. She's fantastic. She Great. is the festival director. And uh, so this is our second year. We've shown over 30 films each year. And that's a just an, well, not an offshoot, but that's an addition to the emerging filmmakers. That's right, that's right, the emerging and, filmmakers. And you've been doing that for how many years now? I've been involved with that since 2005. It was founded in 2002. Okay. It screens the third Thursday of every month, mm -hmm. um, all locally produced short films. Hmm. We've shown over 800 films in that time. We have shown things from people who went on to win Oscars and people who have gone on to have great careers. And we show all kinds of films, music videos, docs, wow. short narratives, animated pieces. This is just open to the public? Open to the public. How it's do people submit, get accepted? Go to the uh, Bug Theater website, which mm -hmm. is bugtheater.org, mm -hmm. um, and there's submission guidelines for there, or they can just contact me. Is it really competitive? I mean, do you have to be like top of the line to do this kind no, of stuff? No, we, or can we will show. Falling off a trampoline, submit that. Yeah, <laughs> yes. If, if it's good, we'll show it. Um, we try and accommodate. Everybody. I mean, okay. there are some movies that are just so unwatchable that yeah. we can't show them. But we had Daniel Youngie out uh, for our 10th anniversary. He recently won an Oscar for a um, short documentary. And one of the things he mentioned that I thought was really interesting was, here's a guy that's at the absolute top of his career, and he still considers himself an emerging filmmaker. He's still learning. Okay. And so we show some amazing film and people who are learning. And we want yeah. everybody to to have a place to show. It's five dollars and it's the Buck Theater was the building went up a hundred years ago. It was an old Nickelodeon mm. movie house. So mm. it's uh, has a long history of being a, a Denver film resource. Okay. So and I've been hosting that probably since two thousand and eight or so. But you get up before the each film and I get up and then we have a question and answer, so we let mm. the film they get feedback. Mm, okay. Sometimes it's uh, favorable, sometimes not. We okay. we hope it's constructive. Wow. Um, and uh, it's a very fun night. Third okay. Thursday, at eight o'clock. And we would love for more Colorado Springs residents to submit. We know sure. it's a long drive, but. Uh, it's a, it's a really fun night, and it's a great networking okay. opportunity. Okay, great. So. All right, now the web series. What's that all the about? The web series. Uh, we are hoping to start production on that very soon. Uh, I'm actually working on two. One I was hired to write and direct called Analyzing Annie, and that's about a uh, therapist who's so good at her job, she doesn't have any repeat customers, so she has <laughs> to. Uh, again, it's that sort of ironic twist. Yeah, yeah. So she has to take people who uh, have no chance of getting better, oh, okay. like married couples. Or, you know, people who, who have real deep, and, yeah. and that's not who she's really well suited for. Right. Um, so it's mostly comedy. It's comedy. It's, it's like a lot of my stuff. It's, it's comic comedy, but it's also sort of dark. Sure. Sure. So it has that iron, ironic twist to it. Uh, but the one that I've uh, been spending a lot of my time on is called The Stalker. Mm. It's uh, sort of a graphic novel. Uh, we've got 10 episodes planned out, and it's about a, a person that has suffered head trauma, and he is, you think he is stalking women, but what he has really done is he's sort of tuned into the idea that they are in danger from somebody either near to them or a stranger, and he follows them to, protect them. to sort of intercede at the, at the right moment. Hmm. So he's kind of an unlikely superhero. Huh. Yeah. Huh. So, okay. 
that we're just trying to get all the resources lined up and yeah. the right people and all that stuff. Yeah. So those are the two sort of web-based things that we're working on. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. All right. Um, and then and then the uh, feature film that's soon to be released. Jimmy said. We right? sure hope so. Uh, yeah. Jimmy said. Yeah. We we began shooting that in 2009, and 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 so much of what I'm doing now is from that is that what I learned being on set directing that and what I needed to know for the next one and it um, has just been in post for a really long time when you have virtually no money you yeah. people get to it when they can and a lot of times you turn your movie over to people and four months later they have not done what you had hoped they were so you have to yeah. move on to someone someone new so we hope to have that ready for public viewing uh, in the next couple of months, we're, we okay. began we began color correction, which is sort of the last step for us, and uh, that's hopefully it'll be done fairly Don't take soon. Too long. Yeah. Actually, you know, we have a trailer. We have a trailer. We have a trailer. Said. Yeah. Well, let's yeah. see the trailer. Is it okay if we show it? Sure. Yeah. Let's yeah. let's give I'm people an idea. Of the trailer was, but I think we shot come. the trailer in 2009 <laughs> as well. So uh, this will be like a trip down memory lane. <laughs> okay. Well, here we go. Your your this is your life. All this right. This is my life. Um, let's just take a quick look at this short trailer for um, our guest Patrick Sheridan's feature film, Jimmy Said. Hi. I have your little lady explorer cookies. Shoot him, I hate him so much. And that was the trailer for Jimmy Said by Patrick Sheridan. Okay, we look forward to seeing it. Okay. I look forward to seeing it in the theater, too. <laughs> you do, too. Yes. I'm sure more than we do. Okay, well, then, just in closing, we want to give people information about how to see these things. I mean, the barking horse and stuff. People are going to want to see those again for themselves. So right. if they don't watch it here on Colorado Cinema Spotlight, um, where is the site they can go to get access It's to on these? Vimeo. You can just uh, go to the Vimeo site and put in the barking horse. Okay. You can also go to the Twitter account, which is twitter.com forward slash the barking horse, all one word. Uh, and on that site is a link to the video that goes back to Vimeo. Okay. We'll have it on, it's also on the Paddy Wagon. That's uh, your website? Yes, paddywagonfilms.com is my website, and information on all of these movies will be there. Okay. And you can find me on Facebook. Okay, Patrick Sheridan. Patrick Sheridan, I'm in okay. Denver. Okay, great, so, and we'll try to get the links on our page right. too, Facebook page too, so people mm -hmm. can find you in multiple ways. And they can email me, I'm at patpub62 at msn.com. Yeah. 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 So, okay. I'm an easy guy to find. Yeah. For okay. better or worse. <laughs> for better, for sure. For sure. Thanks so much for being on the show. It's You're really, very welcome. really been a pleasure. Mm -hmm. um, the films are great. Can't wait to see what's coming up next. Um, so thanks a lot for taking the time. Well, thank you for having me. Glad I could finally make it down here. Okay. I'm David Rasmussen. This is Colorado Cinema Spotlight. Uh, we appreciate your comments and suggestions. You can find us on Facebook, Colorado Cinema Spotlight on Facebook. Also, we're always eager to see new films and know about new Colorado filmmakers, so let us know about them, too, through the Facebook site. Thanks for joining us.